open your Bibles to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, but in introduction as you're getting there, and we're, we're moving toward that, we live in a world that longs for, craves, cries out for signs. They want signs. They, they, and I don't mean like billboards and things like that, but they really want signs from God. And I think about it when I think of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, where Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun. This is nothing different to think about a generation that is craving for signs from God. You can look back to Matthew, and you don't need to turn there, but Matthew chapter 12 and then also Matthew chapter 16, Jesus deals with people that are longing for signs. They come to Him and say, give us a sign, give us a sign, give us a sign. He refers to them as an evil and adulterous generation. He says an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign. And in both instances, he says, you're not going to get a sign except for the sign of Jonah. And I'll touch on that a little bit more later. But the point of it is, is people today still seek signs. You see it on the news sometimes. There are people who will, they're so desperate to see something that they'll see it even in a pancake. They'll see a sign in a pancake or on wood paneling or something that they think is there. But oftentimes people will be going through situations And they'll cry out to God, God, if you just do this, then I'll know that you're there. And I'll tell you, sometimes God honors that. Sometimes God hears that. But not every time. Because the point of it is, is that oftentimes we're seeking for a sign, but the greatest sign that could ever be given that God is there and that God loves you and that God has demonstrated that love for you is found in the cross and in the resurrection of Christ. That's it. And when you come to the resurrection of Christ, there's really not a greater precursor to that than the resurrection of Lazarus. And that's what we're going to get into in here. But on the front end, I want to explain to you a little something about the resurrection of Lazarus and how it is not the same thing as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some differences. Number one, Lazarus Lazarus was not raised to a glorified state. He would have died again. He died eventually at some point in his life. Number two, Lazarus was not crucified. He wasn't dying on the cross for anybody's sins. And he also wasn't in the tomb for just three days. He was in there for four days. So there's many things, many differences concerning that. But the point of it is, is again, this is a foreshadowing to what was going to happen through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so open your Bibles if you're there. I want to read this text with you, but I want to start back in John 10, 41, because that sort of sets the context for what we're about to find out in this chapter. But we're just going to cover the first four verses of chapter 11 today. So looking in Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 41, going to 11, verse 4. It says, And many came to him, speaking about Jesus, and they said, John did no sign. But everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, The illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Let's pray together. Father, any time we approach something in your word that is extremely familiar to us, Father, we want to hear something fresh from you today in this. We're not looking for a new interpretation of it, Lord, because your word stands firm. We know that things will fade but Your Word stands eternal. And so, Lord, as we approach this text, and and truly something familiar to many people is the resurrection of Lazarus. But, Father, we want to have You communicate something to us today, something that we can apply to our lives. And as we leave here and throughout this week, it's something, Lord, that we'll be meditating on deeply and seeing us grow in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray for that today. Pray, Holy Spirit, that You come and... And you move in our midst and that you teach us today. You open our hearts. You open our eyes and our ears. And so we'll yield this to you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we continue in this, and, and we've been going through the Gospel of John 
quite a while. But the point of it is, I want to revisit what the purpose of this whole gospel is. What was the purpose that John was writing and what God was inspiring John to include in his gospel that maybe wasn't included in the other three synoptics. And I want to re- remind you of John chapter 20, verse 31. In that verse, John writes, these, and he's talking about signs. These signs are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. One commentator puts this whole gospel as the gospel of belief. And that's really what it's about. The things that are included in this are so that we understand that Jesus is the Son of God and that as we believe in Him, we will have life in His name. It's funny when you, when you research things and you look, and people get very critical. They get very critical about the story of Lazarus. And here's one reason they get critical. And these are, these are learned men. These are, these are people who are theologians. And they look at this and they say, well, we're not so sure that this really happened. Maybe it's a parable because we don't find any evidence of it in Matthew, Mark, or Luke in the synoptic gospels. But here's the thing I want us to remember. None of these Gospels were written as a mere biography of everything that Jesus did in His life. That's not the purpose of them. And each Gospel does have a different purpose. And in the Gospel of John, it's about seeing clearly that Jesus is the Son of God. And that by believing in Him, we will have life in His name. And so the idea here, they're thinking, well, because it wasn't included in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, well, then we can't really be sure that it even really happened or, or maybe it wasn't meant as it was said or it's just a teaching tool or something like that. To that, I really do say hogwash. Because here's the thing. You've got to remember that every single gospel and every word in every gospel is inspired by God. And so what they're saying is, well, if John wrote it in here, then it should have happened, and the other gospel should have borrowed it. But the point of it was, the gospels, maybe they were similar to one another, but they weren't necessarily borrowing. God was inspiring. And that's a completely different thing to think on when we come to these things. And so because it's in Lazarus and it's not in the other gospels, the reason for that is, is because it's in, I'm sorry, in John, is because it's in John and not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. That's the only reason. People can spend pages and pages and thousands of words debating this, but the point of it is, it's not in those Gospels. So why worry about that? God has inspired those Gospels, and He has inspired the Gospel of John, and here we have it, and this is what we'll deal with today in our text. And so as we went through this, what we've entered into, some people have labeled this as the period of conflict with Jesus. Remember what happened last week? They picked up stones. And they wanted to stone him. And they weren't able to stone him. And then they wanted to arrest him. And they weren't able to do that as well. But the interesting thing about this and the resurrection of Lazarus, this is the last sign or even the last miracle that we're going to find in the Gospel of John leading up to his death, burial, and resurrection. So it's pretty important. So looking at what happened, and the reason, again, I wanted to include verse 41 in that is because we're dealing with signs. Because earlier Jesus had said to them, and He was talking and pleading with them, they said that He was blaspheming because He put Himself on the same level as God. And He wrote, is it, and this is way back in verse 34, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If He called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of Him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I'm not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. And then this idea here, they realize, wait a minute, John the Baptist didn't do any signs. He wasn't doing anything. He was baptizing. He was leading people to Christ. But everything that he said about Jesus has come to pass. And so that's building the context here of Jesus is showing people that He is the Son of God. He didn't have to walk around and say it constantly. His works were proving that. His signs were proving that. So then we come to verse 11. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany. Bethany was about two miles from Jerusalem. And it's an interesting way that we are introduced to Lazarus. There's not a lot of information on Lazarus. And we're going to realize that there was a very intimate relationship that he had with Jesus, but... The depth of that relationship, we don't know. 
And if somebody comes to you and says, well, this is Lazarus' relationship with Jesus, truly the fact is that's either coming from tradition or speculation. And the Bible doesn't really give us that. But we do know that Jesus was very close to Lazarus. But Lazarus is introduced to us being from Bethany, which is the village of Mary and Martha. And so we don't get a lot about Lazarus, but we realize who his sisters are and we realize the town that he came from. And so the idea here is that the people who were the recipients of John's gospel probably didn't have a good idea who Lazarus was. Because what could have happened is, and if they knew who he was, they would have said, well, there was a certain man who was ill, Lazarus, and that would have been the end of it. They wouldn't have had to have explained he was from Bethany or even at that point that he was Mary and Martha's sister. But on some level, they didn't really know who Lazarus would have been. But you can understand that they did know who Mary and Martha was. And so that's why this is included in the second verse. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with his hair. You guys remember that when we covered that as we gone through the Gospel of John? I hope not because we haven't been there yet. That was a trick. I was seeing who was shaking their heads. Oh yeah, I remember when you preached on that. I haven't preached on that yet. That's actually in John chapter 12. We haven't gotten to that yet. So why include something in chapter 11 that we quite haven't got to yet? The point of that is, is this was a well-known event. Remember this, this is a gospel. This is something that was circulating around to a lot of different people. And so when they would have come to this, they would have known some of the people. And as they came, and it was Mary who anointed the Lord, they would have said, yes, I've heard that story. I remember hearing through an oral tradition about Mary and what she did. And so in the chronology of the Gospel of John, which it's not necessarily a chronological book, but in this case it is, that hasn't happened yet. So we'll get to that in in chapter 12. But the point of it is, is Mary was well known for what she did. And you can look. Let's go ahead and look at that in John chapter 12 if you want to flip over there. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, it says, Six days before the Passover. So we know that that is much closer to the event of Jesus' triumphal entry. It's much closer to His death and resurrection. It says, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was. Now we're going to learn about Lazarus. Whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So chapter 12 was looking back to chapter 11. So they gave him, uh, they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those who was reclining with him at table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. That's the event. And remember what this was all about. The house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this, because not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. But Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep, keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you not, will not always have me. So the point of what Mary was doing is she was anointing his body, looking forward to the time when he was going to die. Looking forward to that time when he would be placed in the tomb. So she was in essence preparing that for Jesus, preparing his body for that, but also weeping over him and anointing him with her tears. And so back to chapter 11, that's the event. That's how Mary is so well known and Martha would have been well known. And then we find Lazarus. Lazarus being her brother who has fallen ill. So what do the sisters do? Verse 3, the sisters do something. They send word to Jesus and say, Lord... He whom you love is ill. And the idea behind this Lord was probably, sir, it was more of a sign of respect toward Jesus. But those words right there are amazing to me. He whom you love is ill. That shows that unique, that special relationship that Jesus had with Lazarus. There was something close there. Now, Jesus knew a lot of people and Jesus had relationships with lots of people, but there's something unique in this relationship and how he felt about Lazarus and even Martha and Mary. But look at what Jesus' response was in verse 4. When Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Now, if you know the story about Lazarus, you know what's going to happen later in chapter 11. Lazarus dies. And so you would think of the response of Jesus having heard that his good close friend has fallen ill. You would think he would immediately react. 
And maybe if all he was, and one commentator says this, if all Jesus was was a mere man, then you would expect him to react immediately and to go and to give comfort and to be at his side. But Jesus isn't a mere man. Jesus is 100% God, 100% man, and there is something bigger that's taking place here. But I want to just take a side note and, and just sit for a minute on this, realizing that Jesus loves Lazarus, and Jesus is saying that this illness does not lead to death. Physical death for those that Jesus loves, for His followers, for His believers, is really no death at all. And I'm not trying to minimize death. Quite frankly, I look back at, at things that I've done in ministry. I've done a lot more funerals than I've done marriages. I've done a lot more funerals than I have celebrated births in the church. So I don't take death at all lightly in how it impacts people's lives. But the thing about it, when you are a believer in Christ, physical death, what it truly is, it's a transition. It's a vehicle that ushers us into the eternal presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's that removal of the perishable things so that we might be robed with the imperishable and be forever changed in a moment. That's really what death for the believer is. And I'm not talking about the struggle leading up to death, but I mean that moment, that instant. And never forget this. Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. Even at that moment of death, especially, He is right there with you. The world doesn't know this. The world fears death. We have no fear of death if we are in Christ. Because death has been overcome with life. That's the truth of the resurrection. That is the truth for everybody who is in Jesus Christ. That there is no sting or victory anymore in the grave. Because Jesus has conquered that. And He's done it for us as well. But and looking at this and looking at what Lazarus is going through and his illness and his illness that will eventually lead to death, I want to remind us of something. There's something bigger that's taking place in this. If this illness that Lazarus had, according to the words of Jesus, does not lead to death, then what does it lead to? Where is it taking us? Where is it taking Mary and Martha? Where is it taking Lazarus? Where is it taking us? Because it's taking us somewhere. Look at the verse 4, the latter part of that. This illness does not lead to death. Here's where this illness leads. It is for the glory of God. That was the point of this illness. For the glory of God. So that the Son of God may be glorified through it. That's a bold statement. And that is also a statement that can really be misconstrued. Because here's the thing that I want to ask, and this is the question that I want you to have and I want to answer through this text of Scripture. And it's this. What is God's greatest desire? What is the loftiest thing that God wants for Himself in all the universe? And that is His glory. He wants to be glorified. That is the highest desire of God. You go through the Scriptures, you go through the Old Testament, time after time after time we see things for the glory of God's name, for the glory of the Lord, all of these things over and over and over again. And that is the highest thing. That is the highest desire of God, that He be glorified. Now, it's easy to look at that and say, how arrogant. And it would be arrogant if a human being desired their glory as the highest and chief aim of their entire life. But God's not a human. God is worthy of all glory. He is worthy of all praise. So therefore, it's not arrogance. He's God. There's nothing that's going to be greater than Him to put all of our glory in. There's not going to be anyone greater to trust with all of our heart. That's why on the Sabbath, at the beginning of the Sabbath, Israel would pray, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, and with all your strength, all your soul, everything that you have. You are to love the Lord your God because there's nothing greater than Him. He's the pinnacle. And so thinking about this, that is his highest desire for himself <clears throat> is his glory. Now, thinking about what glory means. And I don't know if we've ever touched on this definition of glory, but I do have a working definition for glory. When you look in the scriptures, you see things with glory. When Solomon dedicated his temple, Solomon was there and he prayed. And you'll remember that as he prayed, the glory of the Lord came down and filled the temple to where they couldn't even minister inside the temple. 
And so the glory of the Lord, there's something about it that is translated and there's something about it that's really tangible. So here's my definition of glory. It's a tangible manifestation of the divine attributes of God. When God's glory moves into a place, there is something so real and so tangible that oftentimes people would fall flat on their face in worship, in praise, in adoration, But at the same time, without something audibly being communicated, something is being told to those people about God that causes them to fall flat on their faces. So there's something being taught to us about the attributes of God. And what that is, is those are the things that make God uniquely God. Those are His attributes. Those things that make Him up that nobody else has. That only God has because God is unique in that sense. And so as we look at that idea then of glory, we see the Son of God and that He is going to be glorified in this. We see that the Son of God has the ultimate power over illness and death and the tomb. But when you come to this idea of glory, the ultimate aspect of glory is to make God known. He wants His name to be glorified and He wants to be glorified in this so that He can be known as the one who overcomes the tomb and overcomes the grave. If God's greatest desire is for His glory, I'm going to ask you this question. What then should our greatest desire in God be? Because if if a tangible expression of those things that make God uniquely God enter in when His glory comes in, then He is making Himself known. So in this, as we look at what happens, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God. God is going to be teaching something to the people about who He is that makes Him uniquely God. Now think about this idea here. If God's greatest desire is for His glory, what should our greatest desire in God be? To live for His glory. Remember the scripture though. For all have sinned. And what? We've fallen short of the glory of God. We have fallen short, and that doesn't mean necessarily in perfection, but what it means is we have fallen short in communicating to a world who God is, because that's what sin does. Sin shuts God out, and it cuts us off. That's what sin does. That's what it did with Adam and Eve. That's what it does even in our own lives. That's why Jesus Christ had to go and die on the cross. We are to make God known. Why else? We have been made in His image. Think about that. Why else will we have been made in the image of God? And I'm not, that doesn't mean that we look like God. But in His attributes, He has extended some of those to us in the sense of not that we have a divine power, but that we reflect some of the things that make Him God. And we do that and they reflect upon us and off of us to make Him known. That's what our purpose is. To make God known. We do it through the gospel. And you can take this, and there will be people that will argue and think, well, wait a minute, the the greatest thing, the, the highest thing that can be done is that people come to know Christ. That's high, but even above that is God's glory. You look at the cross. The cross was the way Jesus' death on the cross, all of our sins being placed upon Him, His death in our place, His resurrection. The point of that, yes, that brings us to an eternal relationship with God, but ultimately in that eternal relationship, God is glorified. So can you see how the glory of God is what truly transcends all of these things that are done through the cross and through this death? Because in us coming to faith in Jesus Christ, we go out and we share and make God known to a lost and dying world who will, in a very real way, perish without Christ. That's a reality. That's one that should sting us in our hearts a little bit. To realize that people without Christ really do die and really do go to hell for all eternity. That's something that should stir in us and understand that as we go out, we want to share the gospel because we want people to come to faith in Christ. But in that God, you be glorified above all things, God. You be made known that it's you who's saving them, not me, not us. You think about the nation of Israel. They were to make God known. God chose this nation of Israel, not because they were good, not because they were perfect, certainly not because they were going to do everything right, but God chose that nation and He wanted that nation to make Him known in this world. You can go back to Exodus. and Exodus is such an amazing book. If you just go through it and just read about the plagues 
and all that interaction between Moses and Aaron and Pharaoh. Pharaoh had no idea who Yahweh was. He kept saying over and over, and in our translations it'll say, I have no idea who the Lord is. But that's Jehovah, that's Yahweh. And the point of it was is that he was about to know that Yahweh was the God of all creation, not just the God of the Israelites, but he was also God over Egypt, over Pharaoh, over every person. And so Israel and God was going to make himself known as he toppled over each one of these false gods in Egypt through the plagues. And so God's glory was going to move in. He was going to be glorified in all of that. And so thinking about this, God's greatest desire is for his glory. Our greatest desire in God should be to give him glory. So I want to ask this question, Christian. Why do you do what you do? Think about that. What do you do in your life for the glory of God? That should be why you're doing what you're doing. You're doing it for the glory of God. You're not doing it for yourself. You're not doing it for your own attention. You're doing it so that God might be made known to people. That's why we do. That's why we serve. To make Him known. Your talents, abilities, our families, your profession, your schoolwork if you're a kid. The life you live is for His glory. It's not to look at you and so people will look at you and think, wow, what a great person. Well, they've done some incredible things in their lives. No, it's so that they will see that God is incredible. That God is the mighty one. That God is the awesome one. We already touched on the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Who gets the glory in that? Not man. God does. We want people to see the power of the gospel and see that God loves them so that they can see what an awesome God we have. That God is mighty, that God loves us so much that He sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins. And He didn't leave Him there, He raised Him from the dead. But back to Lazarus and understanding what's taking place with this. Jesus said, this illness does not lead to death. I want you to understand something about this illness. Lazarus wasn't some kind of pawn being used in some spiritual chess match with the Jewish religious leaders, okay? He was really ill. That was really happening. An illness, any illness, no matter what it is, is truly a consequence of the fall. It's a show-tell sign that we have sinned against God. Illness is real. Lazarus, his illness was real. And by Jesus saying this illness does not lead to death, He's not minimizing this illness. But I want you to remember this. Even your own illnesses, my own illnesses, our own trials and tribulations, they aren't a toy in the hands of God. They're not just something He's playing with. But on the same hand, there is something bigger than our illnesses, than our suffering and loss, than our trials and tribulations, than our persecutions, even our own death. There is something bigger than that. There was something bigger at stake here than just Lazarus' illness and his death, and that is God's glory, and also that the Son of God may be glorified in it. As we struggle, and we struggle, folks, I know you struggle. We all have times of struggle. There's purpose in it. And please don't take that idea if you say, well, there's purpose in that. That doesn't, that's not minimizing what you're going through. Please know that. God's not about to minimize what you're going through. Just because there's purpose doesn't mean, come on, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get on with your life. That's not what that means. But what it does mean is that in the midst of whatever you're going through, there is grace. And that grace helps us to see that there's a bigger purpose in all of this. It's not just you suffering. It's not just Lazarus dying. The bigger purpose is that God is glorified. That God is being made known to a lost and dying world that He's the remedy for. Because here's the thing. If they are physically dying and they do die, they will face what is known as the second death. And that's an eternal separation from God. Forever and ever and ever. Don't forget that. We've got to remember that as we go out and live a life to glorify God. That people need to come to faith in God. People need the Lord. And so thinking about this and seeing that there is purpose in illness, that there is purpose in your trials and tribulations, and ultimately is that God is glorified. Truly what that does is that turns the tables on our enemy. 
Satan wanted Lazarus to die and remain in the tomb. Satan wants you to go through your trials and tribulations. And therefore, just as Jesus said to Peter, Satan wants to have your faith eclipsed. He wants darkness to fall upon your faith. To where you will not be abiding in the Lord. You will not be living for the Lord. You're not glorifying the Lord. Therefore, people outside of these walls are not learning who God is. But when we're in the midst of struggle and trials and tribulations, and we live for the glory of the Lord, people notice that. And they scratch their heads and they ask questions. How can they be living like this? I know what they're going through. And that points to God. And that points to how faithful God is. How wonderful and awesome our God is. And God in that is glorified. So thinking about this, thinking about your life and your death and taking this lesson from the simple word that this illness does not lead to death, but it's for the glory of God. Think about your life and even your death and everything that we do. Let's be very conscious and very driven to be living for the glory of the Lord. Everything we do, let's see God glorified. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Father, help us. We want to cry out to you. We want to be as unable to pull our bodies out of the tomb just as Lazarus was unable to do that on his own. We want to approach you, God, in such a manner that we confess to you, God, that in our own strength, in our own abilities, we cannot live for your glory. We will fall short of the glory of God if we do it in our own strength because that is sinful. But God, we are begging you and we are asking you as a child to their father, help us to live for your glory. Help us to live so that people may see you, so that your name will be made known in this community, in our state, in our country, and in our world because God, there is nothing more supreme than you. Help us to do that. In our dealings with one another in this church, in our dealings with others outside of this church, God, help us to make you known. Be glorified in those relationships. When we approach church and when we approach your word and these things of the Christian life, God, at the same time, help us to be glorifying your name in those so that you are known above all things. And so, Father, I pray now that you would take the truth of this and challenge us with this in our day-to-day lives, in our moments that we, that we have, God, on this earth as we interact with others and even interact with you. May it all be for your glory. May it all be to make you known. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.